Hello and welcome to a special EMS stroke update from Ohio Health EMS. My name is Eric Cortez. I serve as the System EMS Medical Director for Ohio Health. And I'm joined by Dr. Nirav Vora. He serves as our System Chief for Cerebrovascular Disease at Ohio Health. Dr. Vora, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Cortez. Pleasure to be here. And I understand that you have some very exciting news about some uh, treatment options that Ohio Health is pioneering in regards to acute stroke care. Uh, that's right. That's right. I want to talk today about new uh, new thrombolytic agents that we're using for acute ischemic stroke. Well, I know that our EMS providers are uh, very excited to hear about this. So I'm gonna I'm gonna hand the uh, reins over to you, and and you can get the information out to our EMS providers. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. So, uh, for the last 25 years, 26 years, Altaplace or TPA has been the standard of care in terms of defining acute stroke treatment. So, going back to 1995, when this drug was uh, first reported in the New England Journal in 1996, when it was FDA approved, uh, we knew that you could take a patient who's having an acute ischemic stroke within the first three hours and give IV TPA or IV alteplase. And this would uh, dramatically uh, improve the deficits from the stroke uh, because the clot burden that was causing the ischemia would now uh, be reperfused. And this has been the mainstay of therapy, but now we've had a quarter century of experience with this medication and we've realized that there are some pitfalls and some definite failures with this medication. And there may be new opportunities in a drug that's not really that old either, uh, and that's tenecteplase or TNK. So I wanna talk a little bit about that and to get a better understanding, we'll just take a stroll down uh, kind of the history of, uh, of thrombolytic therapy for arterial occlusive disease. So really, um, all this is stemming from the uh, treatment paradigms of myocardial infarction. So in the early 1980s, streptokinase was a thrombolytic agent as kind of, it was a first generation thrombolytic agent that was used for uh, acute myocardial infarction. And there were different combinations of treatment with streptokinase, streptokinase alone, streptokinase with IV heparin, sub-Q heparin, and, you know, it was towards the middle of that decade, the middle of the 80s, that we started recognizing that a synthetic drug called recombinant tissue plasminogen activator, or what we know today as Altaplace or TPA, was a superior drug to this natural or naturally occurring thrombolytic agent, streptokinase. And so when, when this was given, intravenously for acute myocardial infarction patients and STEMI patients, we saw that the rates of mortality out to 30 days for patients um, uh, with just TPA uh, did better than streptokinase with any other combination. And so by mid 80s, this was the standard of care for a, uh, ST elevation MI. And in fact, you know, by the end of the 80s, uh, it was very clear that by giving uh, giving uh, IV alteplase or TPA intra-arterially or intra-coronary uh, in a cath lab procedure, you were able to achieve 60 to 70% recanalization right away within the first uh, uh, within the first uh, 60 minutes of treatment. And so, what we realized is that thrombolytic therapy is a, is, a, is a mainstay for occlusive disease. Now, at that point in time in 1987, when this study was, was reported in, uh, in the Journal of American Card College of Cardiology, there was no treatment for acute ischemic stroke. And some of you may, may be well aware of the history. Um, some of you may be well aware of the history and and know that for acute ischemic stroke patients, uh, there was no treatment. In fact, uh, they might be given an aspirin at that time, and then we would wait for rehabilitation. So 
after seeing the success of IV TPA, uh, that's where the field in neurology really started to change. And so about from 1987 until 1995, that's where a number of studies take, took place in Europe and here in the United States. And it, and it was our United States study uh, that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. This is the front cover of that week's uh, New England Journal uh, headlining this article that tissue plasminogen activator within three hours, so TPA or alteplase, within three hours improved stroke outcome. And, and what we saw was that patients had a modified Rankin score, which measures disability after a stroke. And then, you know, almost 40% of patients had a modified Rankin score of, of zero to one, meaning they had minimal or, or no disability, whereas about 25% of patients who got placebo uh, did well. So this was definitely a, a, a breakthrough treatment. Now, when you look at this type of study, some of the things that we learned from this uh, study was that TPA works great when you look at stroke patients uh, across the board. So within the study, these are patients who had mild strokes, more moderate strokes, some severe strokes. But we know that patients who had large occlusions with uh, uh, with blockages of the carotid artery or the middle cerebral artery, these patients actually did fairly poorly with IV TPA. And in fact, before this study came out in 1995, a group of researchers at Harvard did a study where they would take a patient who had severe neurologic symptoms, they would do an angiogram, find the blocked artery, infuse TPA, keep that patient on the table for an hour and come back and see if the uh, artery recanalized. And what we found is if you had a carotid artery occlusion or a middle cerebral artery occlusion in the main stem, that your chance that that artery is going to open with just IV TPA alone was a little bit lower than 25%. So TPA was a great treatment for mild to moderate stroke, but maybe didn't work best on on large vessel occlusion stroke. So that was interesting that even though we got FDA approval and we had a positive study, this was largely driven by the fact that TPA worked in mild to moderate stroke. Now, this is 1995. By 1995, TPA or alteplase was already being supplanted by tenecteplase. Tenecteplase was a new drug. It's a third generation thrombolytic agent. And there were already studies and within two years, IV TPA was not used as standard of care for acute myocardial infarction. In fact, tenecteplase and retivase became the standards, standard thrombolytic agents. So let's kind of look at this. What are these two thrombolytic agents and, and what's the difference and what's going to be the implication for acute ischemic stroke? If you look at alteplase, it's a natural occurring enzyme in the body. Our body makes TPA because there's always this clotting and dissolving of clot function going on in our body at the same time. It's part of the homeostasis. And sometimes we have a situation where you have a severe illness that can cause more clotting, for example, COVID-19 and you can have a uh, systemic uh, uh, inflammatory response, which can cause more thrombosis uh, because our system is overwhelmed. Um, or you can have a coagulopathy where, uh, let's say someone who has a hemophilia, for example, or is on anticoagulants, uh, they are going to bleed more. So there's always this homeostasis that we live at. And because our body creates or has, uh, inside tissue plasminogen activator. Plasminogen um, is, um, well, whenever there's a clot, you can break that clot up by taking plasminogen, which is a substance within the bloodstream, a clotting or a, a dissolving factor uh, within the bloodstream and converting it into an active plasmin. Plasmin then binds to the fibrin clot and breaks it up. 
So TPA is a naturally a naturally found enzyme that facilitates that. Now the recombinant TPA that we're able to give is a pharmaceutically created synthetic med me uh, medication that actually is very similar to our body's native TPA. This recombinant TPA is activated once it binds to fibrin. It has a very short half-life and very, very quickly it activates plasminogen into plasmin and then starts the uh, thrombolytic pathway or thrombolytic uh, cascade uh, to break up clot. Now, how is tenecteplase different? Well, tenecteplase is also genetically engineered, and it's only different from TPA at three specific nucleotide sites. So it's almost virtually the same compound, but this minuscule change makes it 14 times more fibrin specific. It makes it 80 fold higher resistance to being degraded within the bloodstream. So when you look at it, when you compare TNK or tenecteplase to alteplase, they work in the same way, but there's less bleeding risk uh, than TPA. There is a longer half-life, there's more fiber and specificity, and we believe that this actually uh, will um, actually dissolve clot better than what we see with alteplase. So for about 20 years, 20, 23 years, uh, tenecteplase has been out there for myocardial infarction, but it has been sitting on the sideline on the shelf for acute ischemic stroke. And we haven't used that medication largely because we're still in the process of getting more patients eligible for IV thrombolysis with alteplase. So as that process has been growing over the last uh, 20, 25 years, it's now time for us to really study uh, tenecteplase. And the first studies were done uh, largely out of Australia. And, and this, this looked at patients who presented with a middle cerebral artery occlusion. And these patients got alteplase. They got tenecteplase at 0 0.1 milligrams per kilogram. And they got tenecteplase at 0 0.25 milligrams per kilogram. It's 25 patients each in each arm. And in these three arms, uh, what we found was that reperfusion was better. The higher dose you went with uh, tenecteplase and also the change in NIH stroke score. So the NIH stroke score decreased means the deficits got better with the higher dose of tenecteplase. And either dose actually um, outperformed uh, alteplase altogether. So this was the first important study to show that, hey, there is benefit, the benefit that we see in myocardial infarction. We also see this in acute ischemic stroke. We just got to figure out the dose. And after several dose escalation studies, we've landed on this dose of 0 0.25 milligrams per kilogram. So this was all a dose. These are all dose escalation studies, but we never had the efficacy study until just a couple of years ago, again, out of Australia. And... Kind of in the in the meantime, what we found was that uh, that the standard of care shouldn't just be thrombolytics. If you've got a if you've got an occluded large vessel in the brain, we need to take a catheter-based approach, similar to what they've done in cardiology, and reperfuse that vessel uh, with mechanical means um, or with aspiration techniques and some of the other devices that we've been pioneering uh, at Ohio Health uh, Neurosciences over the last. 10 to 15 years. But what's interesting is that the Australian study from a couple of years ago called the Extend IA TNK study showed that if you took 100 patients with a large vessel occlusion and gave them IV tenecteplase and then went for a thrombectomy, and you took 100 patients with a large vessel occlusion and gave them IV alteplase and went for thrombectomy, which is our current standard in the United States. What we found is that double the number of patients who get who got the tenecteplase 
would have recanalized their vessel before you even got to the thrombectomy procedure. So they don't even need the procedure compared to those people who got IVTPA, but also the clinical outcomes were better. So 63% of patients who had, uh, who got IV tenecteplase and then a thrombectomy were actually independent after their stroke at 90 days compared to a lower number, statistically lower number uh, with the alteplase group. And this is the first study that has shown that we can actually get better than 60% good outcome in a real world setting for patients who have large vessel occlusion. Right now, if you look at the large, if, if you look at real world settings in our current practice, we do throm we do interventions on patients all the time for thrombectomy. With the newer thrombectomy devices, we've been able to achieve 50% good outcomes in these patients. With the older first generation thrombectomy devices, our good outcome rate was somewhere in the range of about 33 to 40%. So we were able to make a leap from about a third of patients getting better with these procedures to half, but we haven't been able to budge beyond a half over the last uh, five to six years. But tenecteplase seems to be a medication that may help us get better thrombectomy outcomes and recanalization results. So based on these results, we're really excited to open up Central Ohio to this new technology or this new innovation in acute ischemic stroke care. So for all our uh, primary stroke centers, Grant Medical Center, Doctors Hospital, Ohio Health Mansfield Hospital, Marion General Hospital, and at Riverside Methodist, our comprehensive stroke center, patients who present with a large vessel occlusion syndrome are going to be considered for treatment with IV tenecteplase with the hope that we can give them quicker and better uh, uh, reperfusion and clinical outcomes. So what does this mean for EMS? Which patients are gonna be a candidate? This is largely gonna be any patient who is a LAM score of three or higher. These will be candidates who have a large vessel occlusion or a partial uh, large vessel occlusion that would be responsive to IV tenecteplase over IV TPA, and we can give them this therapy at all our comprehensive centers and primary stroke centers. This is an exciting new change and a new leap forward in terms of acute ischemic th stroke thrombolysis. Uh, we hope that uh, our patients will be able to get this medication and maybe not even need a surgical thrombectomy procedure. Uh, because we can give them faster reperfusion. So I'm looking forward to this opportunity for us to collaborate again as we bring more innovation and new changes to the treatment paradigm here in Central Ohio for acute ischemic stroke. Thank you so much. Dr. Vora, that was excellent and, and excellent rundown of, of the history of thrombolytics and stroke as well as these recent innovations that um, Ohio Health is leading. Um, when it comes to uh, making decisions about destinations, how is this gonna impact pre-hospital protocols? Um, and what types of facilities will be utilizing to net the place versus all the place? Yeah, great questions. Um, so I, you know, right now, if you look at the Ohio, Ohio Health uh, policy in terms of triaging acute ischemic stroke patients. We believe that patients who have a high LAM score, so a LAM score of four or higher, are very likely to have a large vessel occlusion and preferentially should be uh, diverted to the Comprehensive Stroke Center for uh, thrombectomy. Uh, of, you know, of course, we're advocating that uh, these patients would come to Riverside Methodist Hospital because we have the most comprehensive uh, tools in terms of imaging as well as stroke reperfusion devices. We also have a team of uh, vascular neurologists who are uh, the first in the region experienced with using IV tenecteplase, and we can consider these patients uh, consider these patients for treatment with this medication. And then we have a rapid process to thrombectomy, 
uh, to enhance perfusion. Now, there are patients outside of this, so the patients that are a LAMS of three also should be included in this group that's a, that's a likely high likelihood candidate for treatment with IV tenecteplase because we do see a fair number of overlap of patients who have some large vessel occlusions distally uh, that can be treated with IV tenecteplase. We've not seen patients who score a LAMS of zero, one, or two really have any findings on CT angiography. So if you have a patient who's a LAMS of three within a short time window of zero to 4.5 hours of last known well time, uh, then any of our primary stroke centers will be able to handle these patients and initially treat with IV tenecteplase. But those with more severe presentations with the LAMS of four or higher, we definitely want to see them at our comprehensive stroke center for thrombectomy quickly. Thanks, Dr. Vora. That's helpful. Um, I had one more question. In this study that you have on the screen, um, I believe this study, they started out by basically structuring it as a non-inferiority study, meaning they were just trying to show that it wasn't any worse than Alteplase. But what they found in the study was that it was probably a little bit better than all to place. So were you surprised by that? And do you think the stroke community was surprised by that? And does that does that support connect place even more that it wasn't just as good as all to place, but it was found to be better? Yeah, that, that's a great point. You, you're absolutely right. So this was statistically structured so that to neck to place should be just as good. And and it actually, you know, blew TPA out of the water in a sense. So uh, it was a surprise. And I, I think a bigger surprise is, is that we, we have been slow in, in the United States to really adopt this. The American Heart Association gave this a class two recommendation. And there have been several other centers that have started to adopt tenecteplase. And recently at the international stroke meeting, uh, a few centers uh, did a study to validate these results and found very similar results. So, you know, this, this type of, um, uh, you know, this type of uh, uh, treatment seems like it's only going to gain ground uh, and become the trend going further. And we're, we're going to be ahead of that trend here in central Ohio. Yeah, thank you. That's really exciting. For any of our uh, EMS providers that are interested in taking a deep dive into this paper, our emergency medicine uh, residency program within Ohio Health uh, will be evaluating this paper in our journal club in uh, June. So if you're interested in attending that or uh, listening in, it'll be remote, uh, please reach out to me. I'm at eric.cortez at ohiohealth.com, and we can get any EMS provider in to listen to some of the discussions about this paper. Um, if you have any questions or comments for Ohio Health EMS for myself, and especially for Dr. Vora, please feel free to reach out to me and I could forward any questions or comments on to Dr. Vora, uh, and make sure to go to our website and, uh, look at our other online content, ohiohealthems.com, and there will be continuing education content on the website too. Dr. Vora, do you have any closing comments for our EMS providers? No, I think uh, we're looking forward uh, for our first patient. This program went live um, May the 6th. Uh, we've not treated any patient yet, but, uh, but we're looking forward to that opportunity um, uh, to start this process. Excellent. So, Dr. Vore, I want to thank you on behalf of Ohio EMS for uh, getting this excellent, innovative content out to our EMS partners. Uh, this is exciting, and um, we're just very happy and honored to have you uh, be able to speak to our providers. So thank you for your time, and we look forward to future collaboration. Thank you. Thank you so much. So it looks like we're.